All right, let's open our Bibles once again to Nehemiah, and we're in Nehemiah chapter 13. This is likely going to be our last uh, lesson in the book of Nehemiah. We started back on January 9th, 2019, and of course I had to cancel a number of times about every other Wednesday night because of my uh, medical treatment. And uh, God willing, we'll finish tonight here on, uh, on uh, this October 30th, 2019, at uh, 10 months, a yeah, little over 10 months. So uh, let's, let's continue here in Nehemiah chapter 13. And we've gone through, well, we had gone through verse 14 last time in reading and making commentary. Nehemiah has discovered many things out of order in the function of the temple and the service of the Levites. He discovered as a lack of financial support for the priesthood and for the work. Uh, the people were mixing with uh, ungodly, worldly crowd. Uh, the funds that they did give were being diverted and misused um, and then lied about. Uh, and then uh, what we call church politics, uh, many churches suffer through those kinds of squabbles and people's relatives getting uh, special treatment or favoritism along the way that was taking place. Nehemiah solves the problem of uh, pastoral support by putting some honest men in charge of the collections. Look back at verse 13. And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shalamiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, <clears throat> Pedaiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto, the breth unto their brethren. <clears throat> Excuse me. To the, apply that to uh, today, it would mean the, the uh, pastor would get a living wage and um, be able to pay his own bills. He wouldn't have to take a part-time job at Walmart to pay things off. Uh, look back at verse 11 for a moment. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Look at the, notice the updated language of the King James Bible. Today we would say uh, he, he put them in their place when it comes to telling someone off. He says, I set them in their place. Um, let's read verses 15 through 22 right now. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. By the way, I know it's spelled V-I-C-T-U-A-L, but it's pronounced victuals. Jethro Bodine asked Granny when Vittles was going to be ready. That's how it's pronounced, Vittles. Uh, there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city, yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice, then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. <clears throat> this Sabbath was the regular weekly Sabbath approximately 6 p.m. Friday evening 
to 6 p.m. Saturday evening. Outside of Palestine's time zone, no one could keep the Sabbath at the same time Israel was keeping it. And this is a major flaw in Ellen G. White's Seventh-day Adventism. Um, here in California, an Adventist would have to start observing the Sabbath about 12, about 9 a.m. Friday morning in order to coincide with the Jews' observance at 6 p.m. Friday at their time. We're about nine hours behind uh, Israel. And God forbid you cook any uh, meals on the Sabbath because uh, Exodus 35 verse 3 said, Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Now, we either light the uh, gas burner on a, on a gas range or electric oven, you turn the switch and heat it up, but uh, you bring something else to a boil, you burn something else with it by doing so, and uh, that would have been forbidden. Religious pretenders who think they're keeping the Sabbath day by going to a certain church building on Saturday are doing nothing of the kind. Like I say, it's a, it, it's a clever uh, pretend, but it's not keeping the Sabbath day along with the Jew. A Sabbath day's journey, as mentioned in Acts 1, verse 12, um, they counted the, the distance from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. A Sabbath day's journey uh, was restricted to about a half a mile, slightly over a half mile. So if some Adventist is driving farther than a half mile to go to church on Saturday, he's breaking the Sabbath. That had become the law at the time of Christ and the book of Acts. Let's continue reading verses 23 through 31, the rest of the chapter. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, and Ammon, and of Moab. <clears throat> and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, for your, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who is beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed their wards of the priests and the Levites, every one in his business. And for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O my God, for good. Here we go again at the beginning of this section with the problem of race mixing, or as the news media calls it, integration. The Ammonites and the Moabites, mentioned verse 23, would have been from what's called the, the or the east bank, east of the Jordan River, uh, Transjordan, as it was sometimes uh, labeled, I think by Winston Churchill in the 40s or 50s. Uh, the Ashdodites, verse 23, were plainly Philistines. Ashdod was a principal city of the Philistines, uh, along with four others, and they were, were these. Uh, Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. Those were the five, five principal cities in the territory of the Philistines, uh, according to 1 Samuel 6, verse 17. The Holy Land was first called Palestina in Exodus 15, verse 19, hence Palestine today, ever since about 70 AD, when the Romans came in and uh, destroyed the temple again in their day and uh, drove Jews 
all around the world from that point on. Notice Nehemiah's conduct there in verse 25. Let's read that verse again. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Uh, it's the opposite of Paul's instructions for a New Testament minister. A New Testament pastor or bishop is supposed to be of good behavior, uh, given to hospitality, no striker, not a brawler, among other uh, qualities. According to Nehemiah's own words, he was a contender, a cursor, a smiter, and a plucker. There in verse 25. Um, it also says he, quote, made them swear by God. Go back, go forward rather to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26 and compare that phrase with Paul's testimony before he was saved. Acts chapter 26, and notice there what he says about himself, verse 11. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. But he says, I compelled them to blaspheme, just as Nehemiah made them swear by God. And if you read between the lines, you can see that both Paul and Nehemiah must have been strong-arming a few people to say things they really didn't want to say. <laughs> I think the Bible's a dull book. The Bible's not a dull book. It's not a boring book at all, but you have to be patient with it and pay attention as you're reading and ask God to help you pay attention as you're reading. But um, verses 26 and 27 in our text again, uh, once again. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who is beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? Solomon is a great uh, enigma of sorts. He's both a great uh, type and a foreshadow of Jesus Christ's millennial reign over his kingdom one day by the glory and the splendor he put into the temple and uh, his reign where people came from all around the known world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And his reputation was spread far and wide. And at the same time, he was a great sinner. Um, run back, if you will, to... Um, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 17, and if you look at that, that text we just read a moment ago, <clears throat> you'll see verse 26, um, did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? And then, did outlandish women cause him to sin? Uh, and a third time, verse 27, shall we hearken to you to do all this great evil? And a fourth time, it's to transgress against our God. Uh, when something is stated at least four times for emphasis, then you can be certain God takes it seriously. Race mixing in the Old Testament was a great sin especially for the, for the nation of Israel. Go back to the end of the book of Numbers, and God commanded that all the 12 tribes should keep their own tribes separate from the other 11 tribes, uh, not even to intermarry with, among themselves. So to keep their family and their possessions uh, in the right hands. God wanted to preserve bloodlines and uh, identities of tribes because he had the tribe of Judah specifically in mind as the lineage of the king, the Lord Jesus, one day. But look at Deuteronomy <clears throat> uh, 17 and begin there at verse 16. 
Here God is listing the, the uh, requirements, the things he expects of some king. If they want a king for themselves, then this is what I expect him to be like. Verse 16, he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. Solomon did that. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Solomon certainly did that. That his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Solomon did that. So much so that silver laying on the ground like, like a rock had no more value. There was so much gold everywhere you went in Solomon's kingdom and around the uh, Jerusalem at the time that uh, silver had no value. There was so much gold to be had. Why bother with silver? <clears throat> Verse 18, It shall be that when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And there's no indication that Solomon did that. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Verse 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And um, above all, Solomon promoted idolatry. Uh, go back to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11, and let me start reading there, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. It doesn't mean they were weird, it just means they were not of Israel. They're from a strange country together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Um, a concubine is sort of a second-class wife. Think of some Muslim who's got four wives now in, over in, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, one may be his his favorite, his principal wife. The others are sort of a second. They have a second-class status, uh, but apparently they couldn't. Uh, find a better life for themselves and to become wives of this guy. Well, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, a thousand wives. You know what? Um, I had a friend, Mark Randolph, who said a thousand wives means a thousand mother-in-laws. And, I <laughs> and uh, that's not always uh, peaches and cream either. Verse 4, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil. By the way, back up to verse 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth. That's where we get the, from that comes the word uh, uh, Astarte, Ishtar, Isis, Easter, the goddess who was depicted with the rising of the sun. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech was a god they would sacrifice their own children to to appease that evil God's wrath. Animal, you know, human sacrifices, verse 8. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. 
And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, they should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. All right, we'll go back to our text. Lastly, in Nehemiah chapter 13, notice verse 28. And one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Eliashib was the, the Levite or the priest mentioned earlier in verse 7, who was abusing his authority or his rights in the temple. And he had built a uh, little apartment and cleared out the storeroom and built a little apartment for um, the other one there mentioned. Who is that in verse 7? Uh, Tobiah. <clears throat> and uh, Eliashib's grandson had married the daughter of Sanballat. And if you recall, Sanballat was uh, the, the Horonite. Uh, he was mentioned earlier in chapters 2 and 4 and 6. And he was one of the biggest enemies the Israel had, one of the biggest opponents to them trying to rebuild and reorganize as a people once again. And uh, so once Nehemiah figures out who this guy is, uh, and we need to separate ourselves from any influence of wickedness or, or the possibility of someone who doesn't belong to us trying to influence uh, someone, then he said to him effectively, uh, get your things and don't come back. And beyond that, I'm not, I don't have anything more to add. The Jews here, in, we, we looked at Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilding after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Uh, the kingdoms change, the rulers change in Babylon. But Israel, God had protected, and at this time, Nehemiah was the authority because he was the authority of the king of Persia at the time. Therefore, uh, he was the top dog to oversee the rebuilding. And he organized uh, the Levites, he organized the rebuilding of the temple and the temple wall around Jerusalem. And uh, when he saw something out of order, he had the authority to fix it because he was there under the authority of the Persian king to re restore the Jews back to their land, their homeland. And to, to think how God has protected and preserved the people of the Jew, uh, the descendants of Abraham, down through the centuries to this very day here in 2019 is a real modern miracle. We've all seen it over the course of our lifetimes, how that God has preserved the people, he's preserved the language, and their identity is fixed in them like an instinctive brand. Even if they can't show by some formal proof which tribe they're descended from or that they are even Jews, there's something inside of them that, that knows they are. Um, why do the salmon swim upstream? It's, it's instinctive in them and so forth. And uh, the Jew knows he's a Jew. And uh, for fear of man, uh, many times he tries to conceal that and change his name and sound more Gentile-ish and get along in the Gentile world. But inside he can't cover up the fact that he knows he's a Jew. And God has protected them. God's preserved them and kept them alive, kept their identity alive because he's not finished giving them blessings he once gave to Abraham many, many centuries ago. All right, we're going to stop right there. I appreciate your patience with me as we've gone through the book of Nehemiah. And uh, let's ask the Lord to dismiss us now with the safety and blessing.